Hello everyone. Uh, this is Factoring In, a podcast on culture, media and literature. My name is Gautam Chesurya. I am a management consultant based out of Delhi. Today I am going to discuss about a book that I have recently read. And the book's title is Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. I was really interested uh, in knowing about the book and once I read it, I was completely blown away uh, by the kind of by the information it provided, by challenging what I believed in. And I like to share a few things with you. So what I'm going to do today is to share seven reasons why you should read this book. Okay, without wasting any time, I'm just straight away going into the seven reasons. The number one reason is, uh, it debunks the existing anthropological theories. Okay, so um, what, are the, what are the theories that you usually believe in when it comes to uh, human uh, evolution? Number one is that, uh, humans evolved in a linear fashion, which is uh, from Neanderthals, you reach sap- Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens have evolved to become a present day man. But that's not essentially the case, which uh, the author proves that multiple human species have existed at the same time, and it is possible that these species have either replaced each other to, to become the present day modern human being, or they interbred with each other and to de- to give rise to an entirely new species, which is the pe- which is Homo sapiens as we see it right now. So this is something that author tries to establish, uh, and this is one of the theories he debunks. The other theory that he debunks is that agriculture uh, as a practice was not a leap forward for humanity. It was something uh, that was assumed to be good for a long time, but it 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 is the evidences later prove that the forager way of life that existed before agriculture was more nutritious than agriculture way of life because uh, when, it, when when humans were foraging they used to get a lot of variety food rather than agriculture which was restricted to a few staple staple uh, grains so this sort of restricted the growth of the human brain and the and overall health of the human body and by 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 adopting agriculture what the other consequence was that uh, the 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 <clears throat> breast milk uh, which was given to babies uh, which was in because uh, young the female members of the family was not involved in any hard labor uh, while while they were foraging as opposed to agriculture where they were involved in agriculture production which reduced their time in attending to babies so when they were reduced when they had a reduced time they had reduced time in giving breast milk to the babies so it added to the fact that uh, the babies was also not getting the right nutrition because they were not getting access to breast milk and the other issues like the permanent uh, settlement in a, in a particular land owing to agriculture brought in a lot of diseases to the humankind and uh, the hard hard labor that invo- that uh, that <coughs> agriculture demanded caused a lot of body ailments to uh, the human body which they were not used to when compared to a forager way of life and uh, <coughs> Not to mention that the domesticated animals, <laughs> domesticated animals, uh, their life become very miserable once agriculture started, um, as opposed to them roaming freely in the wild. So, in essence, what agriculture did was uh, it kept people alive. It kept more people alive than for, than uh, for than what what used to be in forager way of life, but it kept alive people in worse conditions. So. <clears throat> You may ask, what is the one final out, one final conclusion that we can get? Uh, agriculture is a product of humanity's search for easier life. So that is one thing that we can conclude from uh, <clears throat> what agriculture was and what kind of conclusion we could we should take from it, from from it. And um, the second reason why you should read the book is that it introduces the idea of imagined realities. Now this is a term which is uh, which could be unknown to a lot of people, but in when once you start once I start explaining, it seems very simple to you, very commonsensical to you. Uh, so, uh, for any human creation, any human creation that we know right now, any intangible human creation that we know right now, is based on human imagination. So, anything that is based on human imagination, that is superimposed on a biological reality, uh, is called as uh, is called a imagined reality. For example, any religion, any form of government, any legal right are considered to be imagined realities. These are all products of human mind. And these are products of human mind that are embedded in material world. So mind you, uh, everything will have a biological backing, but on top of it, it will be like a layer which has, which is a product of human uh, imagination. It, it can extend to the hierarchies of caste, class, race, gender, everything. So we, it, it is an important, it's an interesting observation that all this uh, uh, platforms of discrimination, that is hierarchy of caste, 
class race and gender are have arisen out of uh, imagined realities but now justified based uh, uh, justified on the basis of chance occurrences in historical events so these do not have biological backings is what i'm trying to say uh, it is also important to note that uh, all the language and languages and scripts in this world have arisen from a need to document these imagined realities for example uh, the accounting something as simple as an accounting book or uh, accounting book of a company uh, is imagined from a imagined reality that a company uh, an entity that is a uh, that is a creation of human mind exist and because of which you need a language to support its existence so so this is the second reason uh, the imagine author introduced imagined realities as a integral part of human evolution the third reason why you should read is the uh, revelations on what how what how and why uh, the the pre prehistoric man has influenced the modern man the legacies that uh, the prehistoric man has left for modern man so the number one legacy that he uh, that he identifies is that of the binge eating so what is binge eating binge eating is something that we do when we uh, when we consume a lot of food more than what is necessary of us so how did it how did it take shape uh, primarily because in the in the prehistoric times uh, we did not have enough food uh, supply for us so whenever we had food we had food in plenty we did not take into consideration whether we had food or whether we had enough or not we just had to have as much as possible so that when a difficult time comes in we will have enough fat in our body and then we can use our fat to survive so this was the uh, logic behind that so that dna that that particular gene uh, got ingrained in the human dna and it still continues even now which which is manifested in a way that you know when we go to restaurants we will uh, we will binge eat and uh, we will end up having more than what we require so this is something that has passed on from pre, from the prehistoric man's legacy now the second point is uh, which is again one very common thing in 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 the the very common thing around us which is the infidelity in marriages so we we could the data and the research proves that uh, marriages around us as at a global scale uh, are ending up in divorce more than it used to be so what could be the reason one of the main reasons is infidelity or unfaithfulness so why why is this because uh, in earlier uh, in early days which is a pre prehistoric days uh, man used to not be restricted in uh, marriages which are monogamic in nature the mar- it is doubtful even a concept called marriage exist but whatever sexual relationship existed it was polygamous in nature so polygam polyandry and polygamy was common and it used to give rise to a a, a, a set of it, it never used to give rise to a set of uh, two parenthood uh, parenthood which is based on mother and father but multiple parents so <clears throat> this is something that uh, that uh, prehistoric man has left for the modern man the idea of infidelity now the fourth reason why uh, you should read the book is uh, on honest take on political theories so he believes that now the political theories are completely based on scientific principles so uh, take up any theory you want be it democracy be it capitalism be it communism be it nazism <clears throat> none of the theories are based on scientific facts everything is based on non scientific principles such as um, uh th- let's take let's take the example of liberal progressive theology li- 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 liberal liberal progressive ideology which is uh, basically saying that whatever man uh, the man has a unique worth of its of his own and uh, there is uh, nothing that should restrict the restrict man's actions he is free to do whatever he wants now the problem with this is that the pre- fundamental premise that the man has a unique worth of his own and is special uh, is not proven by a biological fact it is a political or a social assumption which is not proven by a uh, by a scientific fact a similar thing goes for uh, other political theories also for like say for example nazism nazism's funda- one of the fundamental tenets is that a particular race is superior than the other race which is again not backed by biological facts uh, but uh, although uh, political theories are not backed by scientific principles it is not necessarily the other way around science needs politics to survive science need politics to survive because none of the scientific principles would uh, have taken place and would have grown grown popular uh, without the backing of political powers so as if you observe through the chapters of history it is it will it is very much evident that all the imperial projects be it british empire be it uh, french empire dutch empire take any empire that have expanded across uh, across uh, continents it is clear that uh, 
they were backed by a quest for knowledge, quest for scientific knowledge, which provided them with uh, the practical knowledge, technology, and ideological justification for imperial conquest. So it is very important to know that uh, politics are not are not always based on science, but science would need politics uh, more. Uh, so this is some conclusion that uh, we can come to. And the, coming to the fifth reason why you should read this book is money. His take on money is that uh, money is the most efficient system of mutual trust and universal and it's the most easily convertible universal currency in the world. So now, why he, why he would say that is because uh, money, we all know, has no intrinsic value, but it has the potential to change the most intangible values that we believe in. Uh, values such as honor, reality, morality and love all are all challenged by love, uh, all are all challenged by money. Uh, so essentially money is based on the mutual trust of an unknown stranger that uh, this, if you if you exchange this paper, I would get uh, uh, in exchange of, uh, exchange goods and services of that much value. So the whole idea is it is it is it it is driving our world to become a heartless marketplace. So this is something that author is trying to convey, and it's very and it's a very unique and important learning that we have to embrace. The sixth point is that of uh, the sixth point why you should read the read the book is that of culture. The author says that there are no authentic cultures left in the world. Everything is globalized, and the culture that would consist of economic, social, legal, scientific, and uh, geopolitical systems have all merged together to form us of form a universal platform which means you can't differentiate an economic system or a geopolitical system or a legal system between countries and find large differences so this has been a result of a globalization process and uh, and it is what it and how it came to be uh, imperial forces of empires uh, has assimilated uh, multi ethnic cultures onto themselves for example roman culture uh, or uh, assyrian culture or Greek culture, all these have brought in multiple, uh, uh, multiple, multi-ethnic uh, cultures into itself, and it has formed a unique, unique culture of its own. So, <clears throat> and this legacy can be seen in the case of languages also, where at this, if you notice, all the uh, all the popular languages we right now speak are uh, have are imperial languages, be it uh, English, be it Spain, be it Spanish, be it Arabic, any language, be it French, any language that is. That is considered to be universal are of imperial uh, are all are all, are all result of imperial dominance. Now the last and final point, uh, which is like a summation of uh, the whole message that uh, the author is trying to send, is that history is not natural and inevitable. Most of the times we see history as something that uh, leads to the progression of the man, inevitably lead to the progression of the man. Every historical event is culminating in man's progress, but it is not that the case. The author backed up that by evidence saying that history is, if you theorize history, history is like a chaotic event which uh, which changes every time you try to predict it. It's like an event if you, if, you, if, if, if you try to predict in a way that, you know, this is going to happen in the future. Uh, that information is, once the information is out, uh, that information, people will respond to the information and people will make sure that information doesn't happen and uh, history will never ever follow that prediction that of, of, of yours. It is, it is very much visible in the case of uh, financial markets that if you are going to predict a certain thing in the market, uh, it is the chances are likely that the market will respond to that prediction and uh, most of the times that prediction will never happen. So once again, uh, to conclude, um, history, we have to understand that history is not necessarily human centric. It are just, those are just events that are happen and uh, events that could uh, either not necessarily be directed to the well-being of human beings. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been my first podcast. So uh, I, I thank you all for having the patience to listen to me. I hope this podcast is interesting. I will be doing more such podcasts on the books, I, books I'm going to read, movies I'm going to watch, and the blogs I'm going to read. So stay tuned. Uh, factoring is going to be. Yeah.